Welcome. My name is Robert Arnold Johnson. I'm a physician, just a few months retired now, who joined Helen Kilzer, Ken Isaacs, and Joe Wujek in founding this lectureship eight years ago, seven years after the death of Dr. Jim McClellan. For the words I'm going to say about Jim, who practiced pulmonary and ICU medicine at Providence St. Mary Medical Center for more than two decades, I'm going to quote excerpts from our description of him on our website. He was available, it seemed to us, having the chance frequently to observe, to patient, to nurse, to physician, to anyone in short, who asked, day or night, weekday or weekend. He was kind in his communications, and not only with patients. He did not bark. He did not humiliate. He was dedicated first to individuals as individuals. He was thoughtful, efficient, and practical with making or recommending a clinical decision, and an ever gracious listener to counsel or advice. He was a colleague one never tired of. We have had the mission that these attributes of Jim should be celebrated annually by a lecture in his name. Please see our website for a description of how our effort got going, who has provided the money for it, how our committee was formed and how it functions, how we believe the term humanity might be defined in the context of the lecture's principal title, Humanity and Clinical Care, and for a list of the six speakers who, so far, have put it into action. I'd like to just mention the names of the members of our current board. Maybe you could just uh, raise your hand if you're here. Uh, <clears throat> Carol Alexander, Linda Herbert, Casey McClellan, and three of his brothers are here with him tonight. <clears throat> Kimberly Mueller, Dr. Jane Scribner. Did I say Linda Herbert? Yeah, good, okay. And Joe Wujek. There is another member of the committee, other than myself, that I'm now going to say a few words about. <clears throat> I'll now introduce a newer member of our committee. Notice that I did not say younger, though he is by a bit. Greg Brown was one of a few physicians I met on my first visit to Walla Walla and St. Mary Medical and St. Mary Hospital. It was not yet called Medical Center, and the term Providence was decades away from being added to its title. He was the director of the emergency room at the time. My impression was very positive. It is no exaggeration to say that imp that impression played a role in my decision to come here and leave my job in Boston. Within a few years, after having played an important role in helping Walla Walla's paramedic team become finely tuned and getting an air transport for extremely ill patients in place and for creating inspiration for what later would evolve into our trauma team, he left us. Can you believe it? True, he went on to directorships of other medical serv emergency services, even to serve a <clears throat> term as president of the Washington chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians. And I do urge forgiveness. First, he is a local alum, having re <clears throat> received his bachelor's degree from Whitman in biology in 1970, 
So we might cut him a little bit of slack. Second, he returned here to retire, whereupon we promptly recruited him to the board that administers this lectureship. There is much, much more that I might say about him and the fascinating, complicated career that he has crafted, but I won't, at least not tonight. Dr. Greg Brown will introduce our seventh McClellan speaker. Wow, thank you, Bob. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and to introduce the speaker. Um, I must admit that um, he is partially responsible for me leaving Walla Walla <laughs> back in the day. Um, um, the speaker tonight is someone that, that I've known for 30 plus years. Uh, he's a friend, a colleague, a mentor, and it's a pleasure for me to formally introduce him. He is a a graduate of Reed College uh, as an undergraduate, Cornell Medical School, um, and then he traveled to California where he started a residency in surgery, and after a year he said, nah, I'd rather be in film. Um, and actually he told me the other night, and I hadn't realized this, he had a choice between medical school and um, films, or uh, between medical school and acting, uh, either go to Cornell or to Yale. Cornell to Yale, I can go play at Yale or I go, and uh, the students that he met with yesterday, well, why didn't you go to Yale? And he said, well, there was this thing called the Vietnam War. And for those of us of a certain age, remember there's a thing called your number of the draft. So fortunately, he went on to medical school missed the draft, um, went through film school, um, and while he was in film school at CalArts, um, he was also moonlighting as an emergency physician. Back in the day when there was no such thing as a residency trained emergency physician. And he um, needed a, 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 a project for his film degree. So he gathered up his fellow students as a filming team and followed him around in the ER and resulted in the diary of a moonlighter. And if you Google that, of course you can Google everything now, um, it's on YouTube, of course. Um, and so from there, Gar um, uh, finished an emergency medicine residency as they started to be developed at USC, uh, moved back to Seattle, uh, and started a, um, a, a company called Northwest Emergency Physicians that's, that collected emergency physicians and staffed hospitals in the Northwest. And that's where Gar and I met. Um, and I went to work for him in Bellingham at the time. From there, uh, over the years, Gar uh, um, and his company joined a larger national company and he became the chief medical officer uh, for Team Health, a national uh, physician staffing company, and really worked hard on what was called the patient safety organization, developing tools to help physicians understand the practice of medicine and how you can do things safely for the patients and provide high quality care. And the beauty of that, and some of the students yesterday saw that, he took his film school knowledge and developed patient safety uh, vignettes that we use uh, for teaching these, these skills. Uh, but Gar never stopped there. He was always doing something other than that. And uh, his journey then continued uh, and he started writing. And we would uh, offer to you at the break today some of his books that you can see uh, for purchase. And, for, um, and his first book was called Widow Walk. Uh, and subsequently, he's written a second book called Isthmus, and now a third book is now finished and will soon be released called The Fairness of the Beasts. So a very accomplished uh, physician, author, film, and tonight he will be talking to you about what is a good doctor. And um, we will uh, have Gar do the presentation. We will then break. Uh, for some refreshments, 
and uh, book signing if you choose. And then afterwards, we invite you back to challenge Gar with your questions and your, and your perspectives as what do you think is a good doctor? What is it that takes it to be a good doctor? So with that, I, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Gar LaSalle. All right. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Bob. Let me uh, get my presentation back up here so I can see what we're doing. All right. Very good. Well, thank you for your introductions, and um, I'd like to uh, thank the committee for uh, working so very hard to bring in uh, a number of speakers who have been uh, uh, people who have distinguished themselves apparently in a variety of other uh, non-medical pursuits in addition to what they do for, uh, in their clinical practices and also to the McClellan family uh, who are honoring their father who from everything I've heard and read about Dr. McClellan was prototypical of what I would consider to be the good physician, the good doctor. And we're going to talk about that a little bit and the, um, the ambiguous terminology that's associated with um, that concept as it is derived from a number of different sources that we experience in our daily lives. Um, I'd like to, if at all possible, get a show of hands here. Uh, how many of you are physicians? Just uh, quickly. Okay, very good. In a good range of ages, et cetera. How many are you, of you are retired now? Okay. Feels kind of good, doesn't it? So, I just retired within the past uh, past two years, same time Greg did. And uh, anybody who's retired understands that uh, when you're busy and active, you don't really retire. You just find other things that you do that you don't get paid for, but you've always wanted to do, right? Okay. All right, well, what are we going to do? What, we are, what are we going to do tonight? Tonight, we are going to um, cover a variety of concepts. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions just to consider, um, challenge your own notions of what a good doctor is, um, and then um, perhaps we'll talk a bit about how the good doctor has been depicted or the not so good doctor has been depicted in literature and in the media, such as film and TV, and how the mentors, the teachers of medicine, and the physicians themselves depict a good physician, and then how the patients um, would define this, the, non, the people who are not the insiders. We'll talk about that. And then we're going to try to, after I rapidly go through that, we're going to talk a bit about the impact of those definitions, the varying definitions, on the self-esteem of a physician and the impact it has in terms of a phenomenon that has lately become uh, very, it's become something that has become increasingly important, which is the whole notion of burnout in this profession, and depression, and unfortunately suicide that's related to the practice of medicine and getting there in the first place. We'll talk about that. Um, we'll have some fun because I'm going to show you some film clips and uh, those of us who are of my vintage will um, remember that. And for the uh, pre-med students who attended the uh, class the uh, day before yesterday, uh, you'll get a chuckle out of stuff that um, I think uh, you might not realize was very important to the concept of what makes a good physician, which is how the media depicted it way back when, when television became a real big deal. So here we go. All right. 
First of all, I just want to distinguish. What do I mean by a good physician? I, uh, when I talk about that, I want to just narrow it down. I'm not talking about people who are non-clinicians who do not see patients on a regular basis. I'm not talking about the researchers, the people who uh, develop the, the protocol and the policies that impact lots and lots of people. Those are good doctors too, irrespective of whether or not they're actually seeing and putting their hands on patients. I'm gonna narrow this down to the docs who in their daily practices have a one-to-one -one exchange with a patient. That's what we're gonna talk about. Because it's such a big topic and, um, and I, have, I have to, I've only got certain amount of, so, so amount of, a certain amount of time to be able to go through all of this. Um, and I'm gonna ask you to ask yourself a lot of questions. I may not answer the questions that show up on the screen, but think about some of these things as we're kind of going through there. I am also talking about um, the traditional forms of medicine rather than the alternative forms of medicine. So allopathic and osteopathic uh, pra practice is primarily based on that because that's generally, generally uh, what is considered uh, mainstream. And um, although I do believe that the whole concept of a good doctor is an individually defined concept, I challenge you to ask yourself whether or not it should be or not whether we ought to coalesce those definitions in some way to benefit the people who are uh, working in that field. So we'll start with um, just this little video vignette. If we can get some sound. All right, what do we see there? Any film students here? We had a few at our, at our lecture. That's, this is a, a masterpiece film that was made in 1957 by Ingmar Bergman. The name of the film is Wild Strawberries. And what you just saw was something from the ending of the film. It is one of the final scenes and the distinguished looking gentleman who marched in with all the rest of those people was going through something called a capping ceremony. It is the highest honor 
in the universities in Sweden. And um, the story is how, as this man is moving to be distinguished, to receive the highest honor that can be granted to physicians and to academicians, um, has a revelation as he's going through it through a series of dreams. And um, uh, we'll show one of the dreams at the end that helped him as he was receiving his cap and having his ring and receiving the diploma, the culmination of his career, a revelation that occurred to him. So we'll think about that in the context of what we're trying to talk about here tonight. Um, but before we do that, let's look at another little video. We're having a little trouble tonight. Science has transformed the practice of medicine, and when you begin treating patients, you'll be able to help them in ways previous generations never could. It will be a challenge, for sure, but you will have the support and the guidance of our amazing faculty who are eager to see you succeed and become the best doctors you can be. Today's setup on the smart is the first step in your training and in what we hope will be a lifetime of learning about medicine and about science. Congratulations again to all of you, and best of luck as you embark on this new adventure. Thank you, Reddy. Okay, so what do we see there? What you saw was something called the white coat ceremony at Cornell. Didn't exist when I was there. When um, I was a medical student in that same hall, um, the uh, president of the hospital, New York Hospital, and the deans both reiterated the same thing. They said, look to your right and look to your left. One of you won't be here next year. Um, <laughs> And there was a Sturm und Drang, so to speak, uh, way of approaching things. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Just uh, suck it all up and that's the way it's gonna be. And um, uh, it's fortunate, I think.